I do think we're in a bubble, but I also think it's unlike any other bubble. The great bubbles of history, whether it's the Stasi bubble or 1929 or the tech bubble, you take a very good economic situation and you merely extrapolate it into the future. And if you do that and it actually occurred, the market would be worth very high multiples of book and earnings and so on. It's a very simple game. Believe in today's perfect conditions and assume unrealistically, as it turns out, that it will go on forever. If you did that today and you extrapolated today's conditions, which are miserable, you would, of course, have the very opposite of a bubble. So that makes it unique. We're in the highest 5% of PEs and we're in the lowest 5% of economic conditions. So there's never been anything like that in history. And why has it happened? We know the trouble is, of course, COVID. And we know the push on stock prices is a combination of central banks, Federal Reserve, and fiscal spending. And it's global. So we have never had such a global agreement that every government is looking to spend and every government is looking for their central bank to accommodate. This is an enormous push. And what we discovered long ago is how effective that is at moving stock prices. It's as if every dollar that is not absorbed by the real world flows through line of least resistance, flows through into asset pricing. That is what has happened. It's a very impressive struggle between the real world of productivity and employment and GDP and the paper world of PE ratios and house prices pushed by easy credit, low interest rates, of course, being key, and just plentiful supplies of money flapping around to those people who are likely to buy houses and stocks. It is not necessarily the case at the small business level at all. So this is not necessarily terrific for the real broad economy but it is clearly terrific for the stock market. And the question is, does the real world eventually catch up? And since this is novel economy, just like the novel virus, you can't be quite as certain as you could in prior bubbles. I described our confidence in prior bubbles as near certain. All of those things, of course, occurred. And you can't be that certain this time because the forces are unique. That's going to make life more intellectually interesting. However, my bet would be, of course, that reality will catch up with the high PEs. When you buy overpriced assets, you get a guarantee of a low return. What you don't get is a guarantee of being wiped out next week. My belief is that if you're trying to time the breaking of a bubble, the value is not that important. All of them are overpriced. And whether they're overpriced at 25 times earnings or 35 times earnings, or in Japan at 65 times earnings, it's very difficult to work out in any sort of academic way since you're dealing with craziness where it's going to peak. I much prefer to look for signs of truly crazy behavior because every bubble that really crashed and broke in a spectacular way, which most of them did, was preceded by craziness, by legendary story. This was notably lacking, as I wrote and talked about over the years of the 10-year bull market. It has not been lacking, really, in this rally off the COVID low. We have seen not only a terrific rate of acceleration in the price rise, double the normal bull market, which is characteristic, that acceleration is characteristic of late stage bubble. But we've also seen wonderful craziness. The SPACs, which are a promise to use your money, give me your money and trust me, I'll do something useful with it, is a real echo of the South Sea bubble where we have such a spectacular opportunity, we can't reveal what the purpose of your money is yet. And they got lots of money and ran off with it. I'm not saying the SPACs will run off with your money, but I am saying it's a real testimonial to the speculative nature. Buying hurts a bankrupt company and having it go up four, five, six times in a real hurry, and so on and so on. You read about your own, having a Tesla quadruple in a year. I own a Tesla, it's a wonderful car. I think they're a spectacularly interesting company, but are they four times the company they were before COVID? Mm, I don't think so. These stories are everywhere, and they're what you need before a bubble breaks. And we saw them in early 2000 and late 99, and we saw them in late 1929 before the crash. We saw them in Japan here we are again. So I think this is an indicator, not a certainty, but a strong possibility that we are quite close to the bubble breaking in terms of psychology, perhaps a matter of weeks or months, not years. And I am sympathetic to the argument, what am I supposed to do? The yields are so low, but the market doesn't care that uh, you don't have easy, safe investments to make. And your desperation is your own matter. But what it does is focus on the difference between short term and long term. On the short term, you can say, I'm offered nothing by fixed income. I get something out of stocks, even though it's half what it seemed to be in the yield. It's still better than nothing, therefore I'll do it, and the price is right. And that is a logic that you hear one way or the other all over the place. And then there's the argument in the long term, which is, in the end, all assets equal replacement costs. 
house prices go up, but if you can build one at half price, you put a ceiling up. If you can create a new company at half price, I am a great fan of venture capital for this reason. I've spent my entire life fighting the Fed, frankly. What I will say is this, that typically the Fed wins many more rounds than we have, but in the end, we've had a knockout. In the end, the Fed has not been able to keep the tech bubble going indefinitely. It sent it over the 21 times earnings of 1929, it sent it up to 35, but it couldn't go on indefinitely. Even Japan went to 65. The price they paid when you finally knocked it out was here we are 31 years later, not even faintly close to the high of 1989. If you go into their real estate market, which was an even bigger bubble, I think the biggest bubble, including the Satsu bubble ever, for tulips, they went down for 30 years and now they're bottoming out maybe but they're bottoming out in central city prices in a quarter of where they came from. The land under the Empress Palace in 1989-90 was indeed worth the state of California, to give you some idea. But we spent a day or two checking it out. It really was true. And the price you pay for that is you could be 50 years later and still not back to that level again. I would say don't fight the Fed if you're a short-term player, but if you're a long-term player, you have to be prepared to fight the Fed on occasion. As long as inflation is not really gathering steam, when you find yourself facing the slowing global economy, you have to kick it in the tail. And it needs massive government stimulus on a sustained basis. A few years ago, I debated Jim Grant, who called me an apostate amongst value managers for hedging about this time is different. I maintain that the four most dangerous words, this time is different, should be replaced by the five most dangerous words, which is this time is never different. That is a very dangerous idea to think that you can never have important permanent changes. And I think almost everything has changed since 2000. So the certainties that we used to have no longer exist. But that was five years ago. That was before the most massive move against value. On any way you care to measure it now, we are off the scale. So I don't think the value is as dependable and useful a weapon as it was for 70 years prior to 2000. But I think it's a very handy weapon when you push parameters so far that it hits historical lows against the growth side. So we may not snap back 120% I would have calculated 20 years ago, but we are going to have a very big reversal in favor of value stocks sooner or later. I think we can be pretty safe about that. And one of the things comes down to the nature of the facts. I don't recommend necessarily going short, but I do recommend owning as few U.S. equities as you can face. Emerging equities, emerging markets, are not only at an unprecedented low relative, but they are actually quite cheap, absolutely, compared to the U.S. on their own. And who are they? They're China, who uh, is going to represent, according to the World Bank, over 30% of the entire world's growth over the next 20 years, and India, which is going to be an increasingly important player. And then you have the Brazil and so on. Collectively, they are much the bigger part now of global GDP. These things move very fast. I think a bet on emerging markets is really betting the future against the past. And uh, the only thing that makes life interesting outside emerging are the fangs. Intellectually interesting, but when they've gone up 10 times in a hurry, you have to say it's intellectually more interesting than it is financially interesting. And the reason I recommend not going short, shorting is a desperately difficult game. You can never be certain that they don't, that the banks and the growth stocks put in one last push that will shake you loose. You simply will not be able to take the pain as a short sell. Government spending done correctly, very good for the economy, very good for workers, which in the US have not had a real increase per hour work since the mid-1970s, can you believe, where even dopey Europe has more than doubled and China and Vietnam has more than tentupled and so on. It is a bit of a pickle. My advice, really quite simple, you emphasize emerging markets, you de-emphasize the U.S. If you have to own the U.S., you go for deep value. I did not say that three years ago, five years ago. But if I had to choose between doing that and avoiding the U.S. entirely, I would do the latter. You only need one big asset class, by the way, to get rich. Emerging markets, as I said, is way over half of the global GDP. It is growing far faster. And because of the size of China, it's guaranteed to do that. It's going to have a much better growth rate this year under stress, much better than the GDP growth of the developed world. And it's got 26 countries in it. It covers every industry you would want. Why would you be moaning and groaning when you have such a good opportunity? It's 10 times earning. It's cheap. It's a great opportunity. By and large, in most of the things that matter to me, I have to make the sick joke that yes, America is exceptional, but it's become exceptionally bad in that we have the 
worst life expectancy, the worst morbidities, the worst social measures of almost anything, children to 16 year olds, number of people in prison, number of people who get shot, on and on and on. It's quite distressing. However, the old rates of 15% maybe will never come back again. Let me just point out that debt is simply double entry bookkeeping. For every dollar of debt, there is someone who is owed a dollar. Why would I care if every other Japanese owns every other Japanese tons of money so that in total, the debt looks intimidating by historical standards? Yet from a US point of view, looking at internal debt, it's totally irrelevant and has proved to be, by the way. They have been moaning about Japanese debt levels for my entire career, and it has never had material consequences that I can see. They have plenty of things going wrong from time to time, but none of them have really come down to...